Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at ATA. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Ipsos, Rina Sengar. Thank you so much, Eddie and Health team. Very warm and wonderful welcome to everyone who's joining us today, whether you're watching on demand on YouTube or you're here with us today. Um, we have a great talk for you today. The title is Doc Talk. We're talking about doctors, uh, how doctors see digital and connected health, specifically looking at telehealth, telehealth and virtual care. My name is Rena Sanger. I'm the global head of digital and connected health at Ipsos. It's also a global market research and insight agency. So we live with data. We collect data from consumers, patients, doctors from around the world, and um, we absolutely adore it. And we like to understand and track the market and see what's happening. And today, I'm thrilled to be sharing some of those snippets of data with you. And my job's going to be made very easy because I have such a wonderful panel to have the discussion with. Three individuals who have a lot of respect for who come with a lot of experience. So we have Joe, David and Mona, who will introduce themselves now. So Joe, why don't you go first? Hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, having me, Rena, for this wonderful discussion. My name is Joe Kavita. I'm the chair of the board at the American Telemedicine Association and also a professor at Harvard Medical School and a practicing clinician. So I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks Joe, David. Hi, Rena. Hi, everyone. My name is David Rue. I am the Global Chief Medical Officer for Microsoft. And by way of background, I'm also a physician. I'm a health services researcher and a technologist. Excited to be here. Thank you. And Mona. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, Mona Siddiqui, I lead Enterprise Clinical Strategy and Quality for Humana. Uh, by background, I'm a primary care physician, also have a background in data science. Um, so looking forward to the discussion today. I am. So am I. You would have seen a theme. The panelists all have a clinician background. <laughs> so they'll be bringing that experience uh, to the talk today. Um, so let's get kick started. I'm going to pop up some slides uh, onto the screen first and just introduce our study that is anchoring some of the discussion today. We're not exclusively only going to focus on this. Uh, but it will uh, center around some of the discussion and some of the insights. So we're looking at Digital Doctor. Digital Doctor is a study that's been running since 2015, and it's with primary care physicians from around the world. We have data sets which are pre-pandemic. So many, we're tracking since 2015, so we really do have a trend line around the market. And of course, we have also run it during this period of time where things have changed so much. So this particular study is in 14 countries. We will be focusing on the USA today, uh, the marketplace which all of our panelists are focused on, and they are, they are some global obviously focused too, but today we're gonna to ask them to focus specifically on the US as a market. And just some logistical elements there for those of you who are researchers, and I'm sure there's other technical notes you want, and you can follow up and ask questions and we can send that to you. The other really important part uh, that I want to convey about this particular study is the definitions that we used. Often when we do research in digital and connected health, people ask, well, what did you show? How do you define digital connected health? And how did you define telehealth? It's really, really important in a research study. So if we show on the next slide, what we have, and there were other, lots of other definitions in this whole survey, like digital therapeutics and things, which we're not gonna get into today. We had a broad definition for connected health, which is shown on the screen. And we showed images of the different types of connected tools that are available in the market. And when it comes to telehealth, we use what we see as the industry standard definition, which is the use of telecommunications and virtual technology to deliver healthcare outside of the traditional healthcare facility. It can include consultations using an app or platforms such as Skype and Zoom, where a video is required. And these solutions well, in our definition, did not include consultations via the phone or text-based messaging conversations. So we were really asking about consults that are happening that do have a virtual component to them with a video or some other form of remote monitoring. 
And we're going to get into definition. We're going to get into that in a little, bit, a little while. But the first insight I want to share with you and I want to discuss with the panel is around the evolution of digital and connected health. If we show you a chart now on the screen, one of the metrics which I've really enjoyed tracking over the years is this one. How much of an agreement do doctors have that connected health devices and tools for patients will form part of treatment plans for certain conditions in the future? In 2015, only one in two clinicians in France agreed with this statement. So this is top two box, they agreed or strongly agreed in that percentage. And over the years, we've now hit almost 100% of doctors agreeing that this is gonna happen. In markets which we see as the front running markets, such as the UK, US, often the first areas where launches happen, uh, the US is a hub for activity and the UK becomes a very easy option to then launch a solution. So it was working and, and moving faster than other European markets. What's interesting to me in the data is we've also seen a slight dip in those countries because they've started to see the challenges of bringing digital and connected health in to their facilities, to their hospitals. So whilst they like the promise, there's a reality that's setting in. So I wanna start with that, with this panel. So let's bring everyone onto the full screen. And Joe, I wanna to talk to you first. I mean. Optimism is there, acceptance is there, this is here, but there's a lot of other nuances underneath the data, which I want to get into with you. But what's your view firstly about the promise and the confidence that doctors have now around digital and connected health? Well, as someone who spent uh, the better part of the last three decades as an evangelist, and, and certainly in the early days felt like I might have been the lone voice howling in the wilderness, uh, that's good, a good looking slide. It, it, as you say, though, you, I think you really hit the nail on the head when you said there's, there's nuance to it. And what you've been asking people is their prediction of the future here. Um, and it's almost, I would say, and my colleagues may disagree with me, but I think it, in 2021, it's almost it calls you out as a Luddite if you don't agree with that statement. Whether you actually are doing anything in your practice or you're tending to do anything, and that's where I think we the nuance is, is as you say, people who, who've had experience over the last year, all of a sudden realize it's not quite as simple maybe as we thought. Um, and there may be some, some just quiet reluctance, but God forbid it, it, you say, I don't believe that statement because then people are going to say, have you, have you been around for the last year? So that's, that's sort of my overall take on it. What do others think? David, do you want to come in? Well, I think there's a lot, been a lot of interest, but something happened in the past year and a half that has changed the whole game, and that is COVID. What we realized was that many folks had been piloting, entertaining these ideas, building some capabilities, testing them out, but it really wasn't until the pandemic hit when there was a change in the need and the urgency to deliver care virtually that both the clinicians and the patients realized that this is something that they needed to do. When they learned how easy it was and the value that it could create, it gave a lot of people confidence that they could do go forward. And then the industry stepped it up. We built further technologies and enhancements to the technologies to make it easier, make it more uh, accessible, integrated into the clinical workflow, built uh, components that allowed for easier scheduling, mobile access, and that has allowed us to be able to move forward. And of course, the reimbursement has been the other key aspect. We know that just without that level of reimbursement, there can be always high level of interest, but it won't be sustained. So I think we started seeing all these factors come together during the past year and a half. The question is, where do we take it from here? Hmm. Mona, what's your experience with clinicians and the shift? Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would echo the comments. I think um, you know two two big forces are are needed. One is the uh, the customer adoption, both from the provider side as well as from um, the uh, the patient side. And then you need the reimbursement conditions to be able to facilitate that adoption. And we've had both as as a um, forcing function last year of COVID. Um, really, the the only mechanism for many people to access care and for providers to provide care 
was through telehealth. So you had sort of the, um, the you know, all of the forcing functions for the, the technology adoption with the CMS sort of um, conditions around reimbursement as well. And I think, you know, just there's a set of things that I think happen when you have an urgent need for something and you sort of work through the things that may be pain points on the margins um, when it's not an urgent condition. Now I think we're stepping back and saying, okay, how is this going to be sustainable? And here are all the pain points that we've identified over the course of the last year. Uh, pain points, frankly, that aren't that different when you think about just transitioning care outside of traditional settings into the home. Um, I think you know telehealth is is one approach to providing that that care and shifting care outside of those traditional settings. But now it's how do you go solve for all of those things that will help enable and accelerate that adoption? Um, and I think that's where the conversation is and, and should be. Yeah, makes sense. It does make sense to me. When we um, look at pre-pandemic data and what's happened with the shift and change, it was approximately a quarter of clinicians who we surveyed who had experience prior to COVID of using telehealth virtual care. That went up times three to above 70% at the height of when things change and everyone had to shift to a virtual, um, virtual consultation format. We also saw confidence uh, levels change. Things like artificial intelligence, machine learning was only seen by a group of clinicians as being really important to their role. All of a sudden, those metrics have also shot up. One thing around when we talk about clinicians and something I've noticed is the pre-COVID, there was a group of doctors who got it, who were in. And actually it was a younger cohort of doctors, particularly that were pushing for it, but they had less influence. And now when I'm interviewing clinicians, I'm, I have seen a shift. I am seeing a shift in, in some of the different kind of uh, dem dem demographics, different age groups, but I also see a difference by therapy area. And, um, you know, I think there's certain therapeutic indications where we're seeing a lot more kind of specialties saying, yep, we, we're going to do this, we're going to do it well, and others not. And this is an open question to whoever wants to answer and lean into it. But do you feel the same? And would you call out any particular therapy areas for that? Well, I mean, mental health is sort of the poster child for success, right? And we, we yeah. uh, although I was just on a call earlier today reminding me that the um, uh, physician fee schedule has in it a uh, provision that you're going to have to be seen uh, in person every six months if you're doing telemental health. We hope that gets stricken, but anyway, I digress. But it, it, mental health is is the is the poster child for success. I think on the other end is ophthalmology. It's pretty hard to to do eye care in your home. You have to put your your chin into something to get for the ophthalmologist mm -hmm. to get anything done. So. Those are the two spectrums. One of the things that I'll just quickly say about my own field that we was an interesting learning experience was that we always, or people I should say, held dermatology out as, as a poster child for telehealth success because it's very visual. And it depends on your practice, but most of the patients have to have an annual skin exam. Very impractical to do that, almost impossible by video in your home. And uh, and we do a lot of little procedures. So it turns out that maybe 10 or 15% of our volume is appropriate for, uh, for telehealth and we're doing it. But so I think other specialties learned along the way too what there's. Last one I'll say, I don't mean to monopolize, but just interesting little uh, anecdotes. O orthopedics, I couldn't get the time of day from an orthopedic surgeon prior to 2020. And now they're pre-op visits, post-op wound checks, home PT. So people adopt it in different ways and everyone's finding their, I think, um, hybrid model. Yeah, I think one of the things that we also have recognized that independent of specialty, there are some types of visits that lend themselves very well to virtual. Uh, oftentimes mm -hmm. these involve just follow-ups or mm -hmm. sharing of latest updates, uh, perhaps even just triage to understand if you need to actually be seen in person or not. A lot of this can be done through digital tools. Uh, we saw early on, there's a lead into the virtual care visit that's very important, understanding when do you need a virtual care visit versus not. And that process of evaluating that can oftentimes be automated. We, uh, during the pandemic, had launched a, a, a health bot that was designed around COVID screening 
And then as part of that assessment, we could determine if an individual was of sufficient risk to then either warrant a teleconsult or perhaps in some cases just be advised to just follow up. And these this level of triage oftentimes does require some type of intervention. We used to always think it had to be face-to-face with a clinician in a hospital or in a clinic, but now we realize that a lot of these type of activities can be done virtually and through digital tools. Yeah, and on the other uh, side of the spectrum, I would say, you know, thinking back to when I was practicing um, more full-time at at Hopkins um, and the number of people who would come to a place like Hopkins for for second opinions um, and travel long distances and be booked for a 30, you know, 45 minute visit and coming in with, you know, paperwork that's like literally this thick. And, you know, how can we ease um, access for um, some of those folks to get those second opinions? Um, And is it always required uh, to be an in-person visit? I think back to a lot of people I've seen um, and and think that I could have done a lot of that work actually um, through telehealth and, and, have saved uh, people, you know, time and money and, and effort. Um, and I think, you know, telehealth has that capacity to just equalize access to some um, some really hard to get care often. Interesting. I think you guys have touched on some great points, which we're going to get into a bit more detail. You know, who is it for? Is it, I love the whole question around equity of access and scalability as well, which we'll come on to a bit more. One thing I want to pull up from Digital Doctor now are the platforms that have been used to run uh, telehealth and virtual consults. Uh, This is a global study, and I can tell you there was a fair amount of variation by country around what was happening. Uh, And this is specifically U.S. data. And the vast majority of clinicians that we surveyed are using what they what we termed as conference platforms, the ones that we would use uh, that are familiar ground. So a Zoom. Microsoft Teams, Skype were given us those examples. Then we also asked about the use of other features which uh, are, enable you to have a consultation remotely. So this could be the use of FaceTime technology, even WhatsApp or other forms of basic uh, telecommunications. And finally, a specialized medical platform so that you've used something which is branded and designed to be a telehealth platform. And interesting, the satisfaction rates are generally pretty good across the board. It wasn't like we saw a really high level of satisfaction for one over the other. And that was a similar story uh, around the globe. So that's a hint of the data. I really want to get into platforms because I find it really interesting. Um, David, I'm going to come to you from the tech side. What, what do you predict to be the future here around these platforms? And what's your view on the data that you've seen? One of the things that we recognize is when a patient sees a doctor, it's more than just simply <clears throat> looking at the person and talking. Uh, there is an exchange of information. There's oftentimes a need to look at what the existing information was in the medical record. There's perhaps an, a lookup of labs, x-rays, images. There is consultation with individuals that occur. There's a whole series of different types of activities that can be enabled through the digital tools. So if we just start with the video conferencing, to make this something that is healthcare specific, we have to first make it HIPAA compliant. Then we have to understand Mm -hmm. how this tool can be integrated into a clinical workflow. So how do we schedule these appointments in accordance with medical records and other scheduling systems? And then as part of that, what's the experience like? In in a in a office, there's a person that waits in a waiting room. We needed to create digital waiting rooms as part of this process. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole series of activities that occur relative to the data itself. If I'm going to showcase data within the Teams environment, for instance, how does that get brought into an environment? Do I have to simply just talk about it or can I actually bring up the images and talk about it? Can I bring in other consultants? And these are all elements of functionality that have been built as part of the process of maturing these platforms to become much more robust and capable of doing the things that we expect when you see a clinician and make it much more relevant. Now, there's even another element of adding artificial intelligence on top of it. During the pandemic, one of our partners, uh, Nuance and Microsoft, launched a a product that was designed around improving clinician workflows. It was was basically taking voice to text, a conversation that a patient and a doctor could have 
converting it into a medical note and integrating into the medical record. But because there was so much virtual care, we integrated that into Teams. And so now what we're starting to see is AI, in particular voice AI, but other analytics being brought in. So now it informs the clinicians. It gives an opportunity to be able to build in tools that clinicians can use to make their lives easier to integrate into the clinical workflows and potentially lead to better decision support. So I, I think the future is really exciting because what we're now looking at is an opportunity to marry so many of these technologies that we know are important, but have to be added on top of the platforms that we're building. Integration, that was gonna be on the list of this conversation. So you've given some really lovely hints there of some of the integrations that you're seeing. Who else would like to comment? Mona Jo, what, what's your views on, on the whole platform piece? Mona. You know, the, the interesting thing I will say about what David just said is, um, in, in some ways, I think the bar is higher for integration with um, telehealth and, and all of the um, uh, sort of next gen tools and what we've traditionally had. Um, so I think it's both that the bar is higher and the opportunity is so much greater for us to do that integration from the ground up and facilitating both the workflows, but the experience piece, piece which you know, frankly has been um, missing um, for a lot of the in-person inter interactions of the face-to-face -face interaction. So I, I find that really interesting, David, the, the thoughtfulness about all of the pieces of integration that you've mentioned there. Mm. Absolutely, Joe. Well, we, we love it when telehealth can be better than face-to-face. -face. Uh, I, I guess the uh, just a couple of comments that really kind of random maybe to, to just fill out maybe what, what my colleagues have said. One is, I think 38% satisfaction ain't so hot. So just want to put that out there that that means 62% of people weren't satisfied uh, with that bottom one. Uh, I, I, the other thing I would say is that some of this is colored by the enforcement discretion uh, that happened early in the pandemic that said that any doctor could use any platform uh, at the time. Um, and I, I dare say that that's happily pretty much in the rear view mirror now because companies like David's and others rose to the occasion and created really good tools that are secure and HIPAA compliant. Um, and if you really feel like you don't want to integrate into your EMR and you don't want to uh, any of that, there's one free one called Doximity that's pretty darn good and that is also uh, secure. So I guess it, 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 it doesn't seem to me like there's any excuse anymore to use FaceTime or, or Google Hangouts or what have you. Our, our patients, um, although the, the other thing about this whole uh, concept of security is that the, the probably most secure part of any of this is the actual audio video call. It, it's think about what hackers want. They don't really want to hack into your call. They want your information. So much more at risk is your EMR info and so forth. But you know, with that said, we, we want to be secure. And I think we can by and large do that these days. So I, I it's one, one that I feel like corrected itself. There's other mm -hmm. barriers like reimbursement and licensure that are much more thorny, but this one seems to have sort of put us on a path where now everyone can participate in, in a way that was probably better than prior to the pandemic. So it sounds to me like there's going to be a much more smaller group of platforms that are expected to be used, and we're seeing the standards of all those things increase. And then on top of that, we're going to see integration of other forms of technology on top of that. Uh, which will just make everything more optimal. Um, I'm going to get onto the whole thing around phone calls because you know you guys know more than anyone. You will sometimes just pick up the phone and have a conversation, and you won't necessarily go down that virtual road. And at the moment, and I showed you the definition we did for our survey at the beginning, we said that phone calls are not what we're referring to. But I mean, I'm going to come to the ATA president first on this. Joe, I mean, what's your view on this? Well, there's been a debate around the telephone. Well, it's, I'll try to simplify it if I can. So more, more information is generally better. The, the, uh, again, I, I was on a call uh, before this where we talked about audio only and, and the physician fee schedule, same general uh, call, uh, topic that I mentioned earlier. And there was this debate about whether you could do, for instance, a, a very good telemental health visit via audio only. Some people felt you could. I would submit that seeing someone in eye contact and their surroundings is, a, is just a tremendous amount of information. 
you know, the flip side is if I want to do a blood pressure check, I probably can do that quite well over audio. Uh, in my field, it's more important to have a crisp, high res image of whatever is on your skin. So I'm going to do telehealth after we get off this call and it's audio only for a couple of hours with supplemented with images. So mm -hmm. it's probably a little bit use case specific, but the other thing, and I, I suspect we're going to delve into this in much more detail, is it is the digital divide crossing tool that we have right now. Um, and if we want to talk at all seriously about disparities, demanding that health plans will only reimburse for video really cuts out so many people that need the service. So I'll just throw that little monkey wrench into it as well. Yeah, I think that's really the core or the crux of the matter. It's around health disparities, health equity. Uh, we, we know clearly there's advantages to doing a more robust telehealth visit with video and remote monitoring. But the reality is not everyone has that capability. Mm -hmm. And it could be everything from lack of affordable broadband access to lack of the digital tools that they have, perhaps even a smartphone. Right. Uh, but these are the barriers that we have to recognize. So if our goal is to provide care that's equitable, then we have to enable at least a minimum bar uh, for both everything from reimbursement to accessibility and, and uh, affordability is a huge part of this as well, finding ways to, to make a lot of these tools more affordable for those. Education and training is another aspect. We, even making it accessible and affordable, how to get individuals to utilize it requires that they know and feel comfortable with it. Uh, that's the level of training and support that really isn't built into the systems today. And as we think about the next steps forward, this is where we're going to need to move forward as we start looking towards a more equitable health system. Uh, just before Mona comes in, because we're literally on the next slide, which is about barriers. So let's let's bring that up and then Mona, I'm going to come straight to you on this one. So it's health team, bring it up. Barriers have always, I mean, barriers are always there. And it's interesting in a pre-COVID world, it was all around training. Uh, the reason men, majority of doctors said I haven't even used telehealth because I just have never been trained. I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to do. Then suddenly they're pushed into doing it. And now it's a, another level up. Right. So they've done it. They don't need that training as much anymore, but they do need better equipment. They're saying that we're struggling to fully assess a patient from their side. They're finding that the equipment is an issue. And then how can they fully carry out a test? Some of the things that Joe was kind of alluding to as well, where he has to really think about when and what, where he uses it. And what they perceive to be the patient barriers, access, internet access, infrastructure, the knowledge of how to use these things, the equity of allowing everyone to have access to such things. And then on top of that, how they can you know, adequately describe their need or their illness. Um, so this feeds very much to some of the stuff that David was just saying. So Mona, I want to bring you in now on, on let's start on the patient piece. What's some of your view on the barriers that have been identified and been discussed? Yeah, I think we have to be really intentional to make sure that technology is able to bridge that divide rather than make it even deeper. Um, there are definitely parts of the country where you go and, and um, for tens, hundreds of miles, there may not be the kind of access that we would want to, to enable um, uh, people to get on video and, and, and have that visit. Um, so I think from my perspective, it's how do we expand access, but then how do we also make sure that we are tracking outcomes, right? That we are not sacrificing um, quality and outcomes um, in the process. So it really, I think, is, is, is twofold, making sure that, um, yes, I think uh, technology literacy is an enormous issue, both from the provider side um, and, uh, and from the patient side. Um, broadband access is continuing to be a challenge across the country. Um, and I think we're gonna have to really um, uh, take a look at um, the ways in which we monitor, not just the, the process metrics for, for quality, but also ultimately the, the types of outcomes um, that we already see a discrepancy in amongst um, uh, uh, minorities and people of color uh, when compared to, to, to white patients. So I think that all of those are, are challenges that I think we're gonna have to make sure that we're keeping track of. And, and, and just adding to that, do you feel people are even keeping track of that? So that it takes quite a nuanced understanding of the issues to say we're gonna attract these KPIs because we know inequity is a risk here. 
but is this not stipulated that they must do that, right? As, as far as I'm, I know. So would it be something that's only happening if the health system wants to? I'm not sure. I think um, yeah, no, I think you're seeing, I, I think traditionally most um, systems have not tracked um, outcomes um, stratified across race and, and uh, economic um, uh, segments. But I think you're seeing that shift happen now in real time. I think, uh, frankly, that's where uh, CMS is headed. I think um, some of our quality organizations are really looking at um, how do we think about metrics to really track that across the industry in a, in a consistent way that we really haven't done before. Um, so, you know, frankly, shame, shame on us as an industry that we haven't done that intentionally in the past and that we needed last year to really um, see the, the, um, the gaps that we've created over time. Um, but I think that that is where the industry is moving now. You know, about five years ago, Microsoft embarked on an initiative to assess and address the issue of affordable broadband access, both within the U.S. and globally. It was called AirBand, and it's still in play today. Uh, over, during that time period, some of the key lessons or learns, uh, learnings that we uh, identified were first that there was an underestimate of the number of people who had uh, access to affordable broadband. And this was something that we had to work closely with organizations like the Pew Institute for Research and others that went out there and started doing the assessments. And they, uh, in many ways, found the, the number of people was dramatically larger than what the FCC was, was identifying. And this has significant implications with regards to federal funding for these type of efforts. And so that was one of the first things, just an awareness that this is a much bigger and broader issue. Second was it wasn't just about a number of people, but originally the thought was that these were just people in rural areas, but there's a significant number of folks in urban uh, areas mm -hmm. as well that, that have, and it's really accessibility to affordable broadband. It's, you know, th that's a key aspect to it. So to address this, one of the things that we did was we started going at, at the very local level to talk to organizations that are building the infrastructure for this, understanding what their barriers were, Sometimes they were technical barriers. Uh, we were looking at different ways to apply it. Uh, one of the considerations was TV white space. Uh, in some cases that has been effective, but uh, in others, it was really about leveraging perhaps affordable MiFi uh, hotspots and, and how can those be delivered uh, to individuals. And so negotiating with all the different providers for these technologies, finding the rates that would be most appropriate, and then trying to deploy this. And to date, uh, we've been able to deploy this uh, globally. We've had about 15 million individuals who have been able to be delivered affordable broadband in the US, about 1.5 million. And so that we're making progress, uh, but it has to be done at a, at a national scale as well. It can't just be organizations trying to do this at a local level. Uh, nationally, there has to be a, an effort to uh, build infrastructure and support to enable all of this to occur. And what we can then do is we can start then thinking about programs to do digital reskilling of individuals. Uh, we know that the whole challenge, and this goes beyond healthcare, we're moving mm -hmm. to a digital age where a lot of the new jobs, and, and that, that's a key social determinant of health, uh, you know, require people to ha be skilled in certain areas. And that, that is something that we also have recognized. A great opportunity with the pandemic to now start looking at some of these issues that have been in many ways neglected, but now are the center of how we might be able to address not only the current pandemic, but future issues beyond. I think, I think, I think you've listed out so many interesting things there that kind of talk to that big access issue. Um, Joe, I want to come to you about that, the things around patients saying, or the perception from doctors about patients struggling with how to use telehealth effectively to talk about their condition and illness. And I, I found that really interesting that it was so up high in the top three uh, among many other things that we had. So, what, I mean, have you heard that before? And what are some of the challenges you're seeing or hearing about from a patient perspective? Well, something like, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna quote, uh, I might be off by 10 or 20% on either side of this number. I just don't remember the exact number, but something like 60% of the video calls that we did in our own delivery system uh, during the first few months of the pandemic. So let's say March through August, uh, defaulted to audio because people couldn't use the technology well. Um, and that is interesting, right? Early on, we 
integrated Zoom into our electronic record. We made it easy for patients to request um, a visit through the portal. We made it easy for doctors to launch a visit through, through the uh, EMR, and it still was pretty choppy. Um, now, we can go back to arguing that audio only is a good thing. So, but, but my point is, we, we have a long ways to go and, and, I, and I will give Microsoft a shout out because they, they have worked very hard to make Teams very usable. Um, I think more people need to, to do that kind of thing where it's just, it's easy. And, and engineers design stuff for engineers. We see that all the time. And um, we need to design so that it's uh, intuitive and easy for people to use this stuff. And we're pretty much, I mean, forget, you know, video is one thing, but when you come to remote monitoring and all that, it, it starts to all of a sudden, well, is Bluetooth connected? And it can get really frustrating for patients really quickly. So I, I always say we need to make it dead simple, design it so that anyone can do it. It's fewer steps. All of that is still on the uh, radar from, from my perspective. Hey, can Absolutely. I just say two, two things there, Rena, really quick? Implicit mm -hmm. in what, what Joe said, one is, you know, it may be okay to let the provider and the patient figure out what the right approach is, right? Rather than for all of us to take a very prescriptive approach and say, mm -hmm. for this thing, we think that the first approach should be an in-person or the first approach should be telephonic. Um, and, and I think providers are in, a, um, in, the, in the right position with their patients to sort of figure that out. The other thing I would say is that we should not wait until the system we design is completely perfect because that's never a state of being that will be achieved in healthcare. And so the question in my mind is, how do we um, continue to learn our way through this, realizing that we're not going to get it right 100% of the time, but that over time we will learn um, patients will become more comfortable, providers will become more comfortable, um, and um, the tools and technologies will also become um, better and more effective. And so um, that would be my one thing in healthcare. We often don't like to use things until they're completely perfect. Uh, we also use things that frankly, just we've been using them for 30, 40 years and they're not perfect, but we continue mm -hmm. to use them. And I think we need to find a happy medium there um, uh, someplace as well. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely, I think it's absolutely fair. Yeah, it's fair. And I love the fact of, you know, yeah, let's not be prescriptive. We've struggled with being so prescriptive for so long. And um, from the user experience perspective, all, one thing I'd say is I, I get to view a lot of interviews where I watch patients trial for the first time an app, trial for the first time a right monitoring tool. And it is incredible to see the number of human factor errors that occur when handling a device to watch how difficult it is to navigate a user experience journey. And the engineers in the room, obviously they're so used to it, they just can't fathom, like why wasn't that so easy? So I think exactly to the two points you're making, consistent feedback, continue testing. You don't need on mass testing, but you need to continue testing it, fresh eyes on your product, because user experience is gonna be the currency that gets this to become scalable. It is, you know, if you can't, if it's not instantly easy, it will go away. And that's definitely been a, the stickiness issue as well. Coming to the doctors, we've sp spoken a lot about the patient, uh, rightly so. But coming to the doctors too, they talked about the inability to fully assess the patient and the equipment piece of it. So a question I have for the group here, I, I get that, right? There's an infrastructure issue, but where is it working well? Is there an example that any of you are aware of where, we're able to get the monitoring tools out and integrate it really well within telehealth. Does that exist yet? That's my question. Well, I, I'm, I'll jump in. I mean, I think the, the use of the Apple Watch to detect atrial fibrillation is a pretty good example. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a ground up example. I don't know when sort of, it wasn't anyone's, maybe Apple's, but nobody's real mass strategy to do that. But you had a condition which is really frustrating because people, come to the doctor and they're fine. And then they go home and they have an attack and they can't. So all of a sudden they can press a button and someone gets a tracing and it's really revolutionized the care of that disease. There probably are many others, but that just came to mind. Hmm. There's a, 
I, I'd say a really interesting use case of how these digital tools have been enabled to transform healthcare and improve outcomes. And it was done with uh, some groups uh, at, at Kaiser Permanente. And what Kaiser had done was they were looking at the cardiac rehabilitation process. And today it's an, traditionally an in-person process where you have to come in for after a heart attack or a certain type of procedure for about six to eight weeks, three times a week for a certain period, maybe 30 minutes or so of exercise. And the question was, how can we improve the completion rate for that program? Mm -hmm. Nationwide, it's less than 50%. And as you can imagine, it's difficult for people to come in for such a prolonged period to make that commitment, mm -hmm. especially if they have family commitments, they have job commitments, childcare, et cetera, and, and throw in weather as well. You know, you've got a lot of factors. This is a perfect setup for how digital virtualization of this program could have a direct impact. And everyone recognized that, but the question was how to do that. And what they realized was in looking at the program itself, it, it wasn't what people had originally thought. There was an original belief that these were high risk patients. You needed to have EKG, or I'm sorry, EKGs on everyone with continuous monitoring. You had to have defibrillators everywhere if they're doing exercise. It turns out most of them were low risk. Uh, there was no need for that level of monitoring. It was actually more of an exercise program, it, just, just coaching them through the, the, and making sure that there were no issues. And when the program was boiled down to the core elements, it was something like a six minute walk test that was digitized on a smartwatch that allowed you to be able to then exercise once a day. The, the key caveat is if you didn't wear it and you didn't do it, it someone would actually know that and they'd call you and, that, and people oh, got yeah. called out. Yeah. And what happened was the program had a huge adoption rate. As you can imagine, people given the choice of coming in in person versus doing this virtually, there was a no brainer. And then on, on top of that, the completion rate because of these other factors went from the, around the mid forties to nearly doubling that. And to give you a sense of why that's important, the number needed to treat to save one life for a patient for cardiac rehab ranges everywhere between seven and 17. So for every seven to 17 patients that are completing this program, you're saving a life. So it's an incredibly important program that we need to continue to do adherence. And by implementing this, uh, they were able to demonstrate great clinical success. Now, there is one other really interesting aspect. They measured readmissions, and they saw the readmission rate drop from 12% to less than 1%. They scaled this to a larger population. They saw similar results. And so now this is being deployed more broadly across all of KP. It's just a great example of how these tools can transform the way that we think of how care is delivered. We oftentimes think in-person first, and then there's the assumptions built into that that we, we, we believe you have to have that in person to get the real benefit, but so much of the benefit actually comes about just by having a mechanism to, for people to stay in touch and for us to be able to allow them to communicate and, and follow through with what they're asked to do and support them in that process. Mm. Am I hearing it right that if people own the devices in their home, it's like consumer device, right? The smartwatch industry has really grown. And therefore, the accessibility for a group of people is there. Do we feel that it's going to be more of that as the smart home movement happens and people have ways of tracking their health? That that's the data that's going to be most usable in consultations? Or I'm just trying to understand, or do you feel there's a future where remote monitoring tools will be part of a virtual platform, a doctor can click a button and it can go over to the patient's home? I mean, where's it? Where's it well, going to go? They're definitely interrelated. And, and it, these conversations, oftentimes we think of them as separate entities, but mm -hmm. it really is all part of different tools in your toolkit that you need to apply in, in a very coordinated manner. And one other thing that I think we have to start looking at is beyond where we currently do with remote monitoring. A lot of remote monitoring is based on each device has a threshold, an upper and lower mm -hmm. limit. And then there's a threshold for alerting. That's not typically... Uh, very helpful because no one metric gives us that level of accuracy and specificity around alerting. Oftentimes it's a combination of these where artificial intelligence can help us interpret all these different signals and then give lead to more important impacts. So as we think about what's the next generation for remote monitoring, it's really going to be about pulling in these different data streams, understanding how this correlates with other patient demographics like age and comorbidities and other types of procedures that have been performed, creating indices that allow us to risk stratify, understanding when changes occur, and then alerting individuals, appropriate individuals to act, and then follow up when, when need be, as opposed to the current process where 
you, you have a metric, maybe it's heart rate or something, and it goes above a certain threshold and then somebody gets alerted that that's not, um, in reality going to be as effective as, as trying to move up towards a more data-driven AI based type of approach. I'm going to go to the Q&A shortly. So if anyone who has a question, do hit the Q&A button. I am going to go there and, and uh, you know, do like a question. If a lot of you like it, it will definitely get asked. So uh, bear in mind that's coming soon. But just before I go to that, um, this whole future prediction thing is going to be important here. And I think, David, you've already kind of done uh, the spiel there where you see that lots of tools and used appropriately and our KPIs are going to evolve. In Digital Doctor, we saw absolutely acceptance from clinicians that, Remote monitoring is going to be one of the main reasons that telehealth really performs well, but that kind of management in between consultations was the big ticket. You know, I want to see a diagnosis, I want to monitor you through telehealth, but I still then want to come and see you back. Um, but tell me your thoughts. I mean, Joe, you go. What's the, where are some of the signals that you're seeing for future use? Well, it certainly didn't hurt us that now telehealth is sort of a household word and, and we have, at least we have that floor to build on now where I, I used to have to explain the word to people I, I don't have to explain it if I offer a patient a follow-up by telehealth we we know exactly what we're talking about whereas prior to 2020 that wasn't the case so that that's just one and, and the reason I bring that up is because the future then that's a springboard for everything else uh, I think some of the things that David mentioned the AI uh, is is happening so fast um, and, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, integrating into parts of our care process that are not necessarily obvious, so not necessarily direct patient care, although that, that probably will come, it's more back-end stuff, but using large data sets to drive decision-making, very important. Um, asynchronous, uh, we talked just a little bit about home testing, that's really going to blossom. Um, and home devices like the title care or things like that where and, and really all that is in service of making it giving a richer data stream to that clinician so they can take care of you virtually and don't have to bring them into a facility thanks joe mona thoughts yeah I, I would say that the umbrella for me for all of this is what I said earlier, which is how do we shift care into more convenient settings, into home and community-based settings, and out of the acute settings that we're used to going to. And so all of the things that we've talked about today, from telehealth to the other tools, to interoperability and integration, um, to the new business models that are required to support all of this, is really in service of making healthcare much more um, consumer friendly, much more convenient, much more accessible. And I don't think it should be seen as technology for technology's sake. I think it needs to be seen as an evolution for how we make healthcare um, easier, better, more accessible for consumers. So um, I, I hope that that is the framing in which we continue to push on uh, the innovations and technology that are required for, for this evolution. Um, and, and um, frankly, I don't think we're, we're going back after last year, but I think we're going to need to continue to demonstrate um, uh, how technology is um, leveling the playing field, making healthcare more equitable. Um, and, and frankly, for, for a little bit, um, having um, a higher bar that needs to be met for, for this to really be able to accelerate outside of the COVID environment. Hmm. Well said. Yeah, thank you so much. We're going to hit the Q&A. Uh, there's definitely a winning question with a few likes here. So it's all around, it's all about reimbursement. Um, so Joe, get ready. Um, what are the predictions uh, on CMS and commercial payers providing permanent reimbursement for telehealth and remote patient monitoring? For example, I read somewhere that United Healthcare just communicated they won't provide reimbursement for telehealth appointments after the emergency coverage expires. So Joe, what's your feedback on that? Well, I certainly don't have a crystal ball and it, it, it really is uh, incredibly thorny and, and, and I think a bit of a letdown uh, because what we're faced with on the provider side is an uncertain future. It's providers aren't just, they're just not used to making big investments and changing the way they 
provide service without some kind of guarantee that that's going to pay off. There are organizations that run on grocery store margins. It's, it's not like we can make these huge bets. So it's problematic. What I heard uh, a couple things that people can probably hang their hat on. The public health emergency is probably gonna go through the end of the calendar year. The physician fee schedule that just came out has CMS extending their uh, reimbursements for three years in order to study um, whatever that means. And whereas we'd love to have it permanent, three years seems like a, an okay compromise. So that gives us some runway to, again, help them study it and get it right. On the commercial side, and I'm sure Mona has comments, but it's it's really, it's all over the map, unfortunately. You have some providers or payers rather going back to the, what they did pre-pandemic, which is to contract with a, a, a Teladoc or an Amwell and deliver something through a patient portal that only their members can get access to. Um, you have some saying, as as was said that, and I don't know if, if United, I, I, I don't know that United has made that Claim, but some saying they won't cover after the PHE. Um, you have some state-based initiatives in Massachusetts. Our governor signed a law in January that said mental health will be covered at parity period. So payers have to cover that. So it's it is unfortunately there's no simple answer. And I wish I wish I could be more positive on that, but it's a bit of a rat's nest right now. Thanks, Joe. I know it's it's not easy and it is a moving target. Um, but some positives there to hang you out, like you said, definitely. Um, David, I think maybe this will come to you, but everyone else will free as well. For telemedicine consultations to really be valuable, the receiving end, we must have instant access to patients' medical record. So how do we suggest we solve this pivotal issue? Um, so from a platform perspective, I suppose I'm coming to you first, but others can comment too. How is it working with integration of patient medical records? Well, this was one of the areas that we identified early on as a critical need. And while we, most of us think of virtual care and a lot of the telehealth platforms as being just video conferencing, the capability to bring in data in a HIPAA compliant manner uh, was and is very important. We built APIs that allowed us to be able to integrate directly with EHRs, leveraging fire standards, uh, and brought those data sets in. And that all expanded our capabilities. So now it was no longer just about a doctor and a patient being able to share information, but we could also then exchange information, perhaps as a lab result, perhaps as an image with a consultant. We could send this information via secure texting uh, to, you, to enable this type of collaboration. And I think that's what we're starting to lean towards, this opportunity where data ends up becoming a centerpiece for the conversation. A really good example is some of the work we've seen around virtual tumor boards, where you've got all these individuals collaborating in one environment. And at the same time, you've got individuals accessing information about the patient, presenting it real time so that everyone can have these discussions and then applying AI on top of that so that you can find information that's very specific for their particular treatment course. I think this is where we're starting to head towards where it's now looking at data-driven AI-based processes care coordination, and expanding our capabilities to allow other individuals to be able to gain access uh, to these tools and provide the decision support to other members of the disciplinary team, multidisciplinary team. And I think that this is where healthcare is going. It's looking that it's no longer just about a physician-patient interaction. It's about entire teams working together uh, in a coordinated manner, but leveraging these digital tools. And data has to be the center of a lot of those discussions. Thank you. Feel free. If there's anything else, by the way, Joe, Mona, just let me give me a signal. Otherwise, I'm going to go to another question. But feel free to jump in on things. Mona, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I, I think um, so. So recently, I was listening to a healthcare services company, and they were saying they're developing these services, and they're not a technology company. And you know, to echo sort of what, what David said, I don't think you can be a healthcare services company and not be a technology company anymore. Um, and you mm -hmm. have to create the right infrastructure. You have to create the right uh, means for sharing data, for making the workflows easier, but also for having the close to real-time access to, to, to data to be able to make those decisions around the right models of care to deploy. But should that care be in the home? Does that care require for that person to be seen by somebody um, uh, more urgently within um, a more acute care setting. I, I think you need um, to just make sure that you're building 
um, that, that data interoperability infrastructure from the ground up, um, it, because that's what we're going to need if we want to create a, a world in which we can move seamlessly from digital to, um, to in-person. Yeah, makes complete sense. There's a question here around, do we know if there are telehealth um, options or, or pilots that are happening which purely cater to the minority or black and minority ethnic communities? Um, so I suppose that's interesting really to me. I mean, I wonder what that looks like. I mean, obviously you have bilingual uh, clinicians who could be on these platforms, but I suppose language itself, you know, understanding the instructions, the download, I mean, how much of that is going on? Uh, I think it's an interesting question, whoever wishes to take it. I don't, I don't know that we have pilots that are focused only on a particular sort of segment of the population. I think what we've done is said, um, here are outcomes that are different, um, where they should not be different across these subsegments. And so how do we go address an improvement in those outcomes by targeting a geographic region to make sure that those outcomes improve? Um, but I don't think we've taken the perspective of let's go after a particular population. It's more here are the discrepancies and outcomes that we're seeing that we need to address. I, I'm not aware of it uh, uh, either. I think it's, it's more people making sure that they have a diverse set of folks for whatever they're working on um, as opposed to targeting any one particular uh, mm. ethnic group. I'm, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, I mean, when we design well, we design well for we make accessibility is, is in the good design. So if right. we des make accessibility for all, then those things become easier. So less friction, less clicks, uh, more touch points, don't have to go to too many hoops to get there. These things have all been proven to make a huge difference to um, being better for everyone and even for marginalized groups. So just uh, something to yeah. factor in there. I think one area rather than ethnicity, but I think looking at accessibility uh, mm. related to disability is probably one of the other areas where technology can be continued to improve upon. This is an area that we focus a lot on. And, and when we think of disability, it can be due to advanced age. It could be due to chronic illness. It could be due to injury. I mean, any one of us can have a level of disability around vision, hearing, uh, and uh, motor. And th these are all, as well as cognition. So, so as we think through mm -hmm. how to make these tools much more accessible to individuals, then we have a truly inclusive approach that allows us to be able to address uh, the entire age spectrum, the entire disease spectrum, and, and a larger number of uh, factors that we haven't yet even thought of. But that's allowed us in many ways to, to also think of new strategies, perhaps having uh, text always running in the background so individuals uh, don't feel uncomfortable if they haven't heard everything, but it's now clear. So mm -hmm. improving upon those capabilities uh, and finding other ways that we can make things easier uh, for individuals to communicate. Yeah, good, great stuff. Uh, Joe, there's a question here around good resources for those individuals that are listening. What's good resources to help them monitor the ever-changing coverage for telehealth? Um, so yeah, just maybe spout out a few resources uh, that this group could be following. It's, it's a plug for ATA, I can't help it, uh, and, but, but it is a very good resource. Uh, I think a couple of newsletters that I read, one is um, Moby Health News is, is a pretty good, from, from the point of view of what's going on in the innovation side. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other digests, but I think ATA is, is probably the main one where uh, it's, it's well worth uh, uh, becoming very familiar with those resources and getting involved, for sure. It's the right plug. It's the place I'd send people as well. <laughs> and we have Telehealth Awareness Week happening as well, right? That's mm -hmm. something worth informing people because I think galvanized action is always a positive thing. So as we wrap up, and I'm, I am really at time, and I'm sorry to all the people who couldn't Q&A back to. I'm sure we can follow up. Um, feel free to, to get in touch with the health team if you want to know more information about Digital Doctor. I'll just ask the panel to say a quick thank you and Joe ask you to plug uh, the, tell people the details for Telehealth uh, Awareness Week. So Joe, do you want to just do that as a goodbye? Yeah, th thank you for having me. I believe it's the third week in September that there's, uh, but there's information on the ATA website and, and it really is a, a wonderful uh, event. I know a lot of people are participating and we look forward to it. Yeah, it'd be great. David? 
Yes, thank you for having me. I see the future is very bright for virtual care, telehealth. Uh, it's really going to be based on many of the initiatives that we have underway, but we also have to figure out ways to better coordinate so that all of this works better together. Thank you, Mona. Uh, thank you for having me. And also just thank you to Joe and David from whom I learn um, every time we speak. So I um, appreciate the conversation and I um, uh, hope we can all work collectively to make sure that we're providing the right level of access for, for, for everybody moving forward. Absolutely. Let's be intentional. I really like that line. I'm going to use it. Let's yeah. be intentional. Um, and with that, I pass back to the health team to close us off. Thank you very much for joining us.